So we start off with Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu is the son of the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Abbas is the paternal uncle. Uh, Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib and his mother's name is Umm Fadl Lubaba bint Al-Harith. Umm Fadl, who's the oldest brother of, ibn Ab- of Abdullah ibn Abbas, Al-Fadl ibn Abbas, Lubaba bint Al-Harith. Okay, so Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he has several um, brothers and sisters. Um, he was born three years before the Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu So obviously you can see that he's born very late in the Seerah. Um, in general. Now, in order to understand his life, you have to understand the family that he was born into, you have to understand the the time period that he was born into. Three years before the Hijrah, what was taking place three years before the Hijrah of the Prophet The boycott, the muqata, okay, of of Banu Hashim. So I want you to imagine this is the world that he's born into. Now what makes Abdullah ibn Abbas unique is that there weren't any other members of the household of the Prophet that were born at this time. Okay, realize this was a very traumatic time and there were no children uh, that were being born at this time. So Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he's born in that time. And whenever he was born, I mean think about this, these people did not even have food, they didn't have even water, clean water to drink, they would actually take dried bones and crush them to eat to survive. They would eat the leaves of trees to survive. So when Abdullah ibn Abbas was born, there wasn't a date to do the tahniq for him. The Prophet ﷺ could not even find a tamra. He couldn't even find a date to do tahniq. Now, the tahniq is obviously when you rub, when you take a piece of the date, and you rub, you rub it on the roof of the mouth of the child. There were no dates. So, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? Whenever Abdullah ibn Abbas anhu was born, Rasulullah ﷺ he held him close and he made du'a for him, and he took his saliva and he put it in the mouth of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And uh, Mujahid, rahimahullah ta'ala, Mujahid said, we don't know of anyone else in the seerah whose tahniq was purely the, the saliva of the Prophet Rasulullah Rasulullah you know, immediately fell in love with this child. He took, this, he took his saliva, he put it in his mouth, and subhanAllah, the sources of seerah, what they tell us is that this was rare good news during those times. You know, these are times when the family of the Prophet Rasulullah were dying, were starving, when the rejection of Islam was taking place all over. So this was a rare good moment, a rare joy for the Prophet Wasallam. So Rasulullah naturally fell in love with this child also because of the time period um, that he was born in. And so that's how it starts off. Now the Prophet Wasallam obviously is not going to see this child for many, many, many years whenever he makes hijrah because Abdullah ibn Abbas does not make hijrah. So let's take a moment inshallah ta'ala and let's study Al-Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Lubaba. Let's look at the parents of Ibn Abbas to see what type of household he came from. So Rasulullah sallallahu he had 12 uncles. Okay, 12 uncles. Eight of them died before the Ba'atha, before the Prophet sallallahu received revelation. Four of them were alive when the Prophet sallallahu received revelation. Do you guys know the names? Quickly. Abu Lahab, Hamza, Al-Abbas, and the most important one, in, in the, Abu Talib, right? In the origins of the seerah. These were four uncles that were alive. Abu Lahab, Al-Abbas, Hamza, and Abu Talib. Okay? And actually, in, in order of age, Abu Lahab, Abu Talib, Al-Abbas, and Hamza. Okay, these were the four uncles that were alive. Two of them rejected Islam. Two of them died in disbelief. Two of them died accepting Islam. So obviously Abu Lahab died you know, in, uh, in disbelief, Abu Talib died in disbelief, Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Al-Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu would both become Muslim. And it's actually very interesting if you study the name of Al-Abbas. Uh, and this will help you sort of remember that these two uncles were actually like brothers to the Prophet ﷺ. Hamza radiallahu anhu was the exact same age as the Prophet ﷺ. Al-Abbas was only three years older than the Prophet ﷺ. And the name of Al-Abbas, Al-Abbas means ismu al-Asad wa huwa yuzamjir. Al-Abbas means the lion when the lion is roaring. Okay? Um, إِذَا أَمْسَكَ بِلَحْمِ الْفَرِيسَ وَأَخَذَ يُقَطِّعُهَا فَهُوَ حَمْزَةً Once the lion gets its prey and it starts eating its prey, then it's named Hamza. Okay? Um, فَإِذَا شَبِعَ وَارْتَوَى فَهُوَ أُسَامَةً <laughs> Once it's full, then it's called Usama. Right, so these three names actually all come from Al-Asad, come from the lion. So Abdul Muttalib named his last two children Al-Abbas and then Hamza. Okay, 
Um, he was born three years before the Prophet ﷺ, as we said, and Al Abbas is, sort, you know, he's the link for the family. He's someone that, that takes pride in being a unifying factor for Quraysh and for his family in particular. Everyone loved Al Abbas. He was someone that constantly used to bring the family together um, in his home. Though he was younger, he was respected by every member of the tribe. Even in the days of Jahliya, he used to take care of the Hujjaj, he used to represent uh, Quraysh. He didn't have the status that Abu Talib had because of his age, so Abu Talib was, was more respected in the tribal sense, but Al-Abbas was someone that was loved by all, that was known to be a unifying uh, figure uh, within the family. He's also known for being extremely generous with his family members. So whenever he earns, literally he was someone that would gather the entire family together and they would all eat at his house. Whenever he earns any money, he, he sends a portion of it to all of his brothers, to all of his sisters to all of his nephews, to all of his nieces. He's someone that's known for being extremely uh, generous to his family. He used to clothe his brothers and his sisters and his nephews and his nieces. So he's someone that's, that's very beloved, not only to the Prophet ﷺ, but to everyone uh, within the family. Now, he protects the Prophet ﷺ during the time of the boycott after the death of Abu Talib. Once Abu Talib passes away, Al-Abbas becomes the protection of the Prophet ﷺ, but he never announced his Islam. Okay, so he still concealed his Islam, and there's a huge difference of opinion as to when Al Abbas ﷺ actually becomes Muslim. We're really not sure because there are indications throughout the Sirah, but he doesn't announce his Islam until right before Fatah Mecca, until right right before the conquest of Mecca. But there are these indications. He he protects the Prophet ﷺ. He even takes him around to the various tribes. Right, as all of these tribes are being introduced to Islam, he represents the Prophet Wasallam. he testifies on, on the part of the character of the Prophet Wasallam, but he's not a Muslim, just like Abu Talib was not a Muslim. And in fact, SubhanAllah, the irony is that he was the one that took the Prophet Wasallam to meet the Ansar, to meet Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj, these tribes from Medina. And, and, and Al-Abbas, when he saw them, he didn't think they were capable of taking care of the Prophet Wasallam because of how young they were. Right, and because at that moment, uh, the Ansar only had amongst them three people over the age of forty. Their parents had all killed each other in the Bu'ath Wars. They they had these tribal wars in Medina and what was Yathrib back then, and their parents all killed each other. So these are a bunch of kids. These are a bunch of twenty-year-olds, twenty-five-year-olds coming to say, "We will take the Prophet ﷺ in, and we will defend him, and we will take care of him." And Subhanallah, the irony of that is that look who his son would become. Right? He thought that these young people were incapable of taking care of the Prophet ﷺ. So when they come out and they meet the Ansar, he takes the Prophet ﷺ to the side and he says, "You want me to give you to these kids? Right? You really want me to to trust these kids with your well-being?" So Al Abbas comes out and he gives he gives the Ansar like a long uncle speech. You know, like look. If you guys aren't capable, we're still capable. And Muhammad Sallallahu he's fine with us. And we will honor him and we will take care of him. And he's in good hands, he's in good protection. So are you sure that you guys are, going to, are, are willing to handle this? You do realize that everyone in the world is going to be after you after you take him in. You know, you're, you're going to have people trying to kill you all over the place. Right now you're a bunch of kids, it's insignificant. But once you take Muhammad Sallallahu in, you will now be wanted. You'll now have wars with all of these people. Do you realize what you're getting yourselves into? And the Ansar, they stood up and they, and they pledged to the Prophet ﷺ. They pledged to protect the Prophet ﷺ with absolutely everything. And whenever it was said, you know, wait a minute, we're giving up everything for the Prophet ﷺ, right? We're giving up our home, our, 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 our homes, our lives, right? Our wealth, our safety, all for this man who's not even one of our tribesmen. What do we get in return, Ya Rasulullah? Rasulullah ﷺ said, Jannah. Paradise. They said it's worth it then. And so they took the Prophet ﷺ in and Al Abbas, he took the Prophet ﷺ to them. Uh, when they took the bay'ah to him, he accompanied the Prophet ﷺ to the Ansar when they pledged uh, their allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ um, both times. So Al Abbas never becomes Muslim. He, he helps the Prophet ﷺ escape Mecca, right? He, he protects the Prophet ﷺ. And the irony is that Al Abbas and Abu Lahab are actually very close. Okay, they're actually very close brothers. So Abu Lahab obviously is the greatest enemy of Islam. Al Abbas is the one who's trying to make a way out for the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Jahal, who's also an uncle, right? Who's also a relative. Abu Jahal is also trying to to kill the Prophet ﷺ, and Al Abbas ta'ala anhu is trying to protect him. So he he obviously manages to get the Prophet ﷺ out. 
Uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says that kunna min al-mustad'afina fi Mecca. We were from the weak and oppressed in Mecca. What he means by that is that Abdullah ibn Abbas says we were a Muslim household. My mother was practicing Islam. We were a Muslim household, right? Al-Abbas was not announcing his Islam, but we were a Muslim household. Abu Rafi' who was the slave of, of, of Al-Abbas, and I want you to remember that name because it's an important name. Abu Rafi' is a very important figure and he is a Muslim. So Abu Rafi' is a Muslim, uh, the mother of Abdullah ibn Abbas um, is a Muslim, right? So they were still keeping their Islam um, you know, uh, in the household. When it comes to Al-Abbas, his, his, his main goal was to protect the Prophet ﷺ. And he sticks up for the Prophet ﷺ um, in many situations. Even the famous story of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Dhar comes from al-Ghifar, from a distant tribe. He accepts Islam and he goes out there and he announces Islam, his Islam. And they start beating on him and they're about to kill Abu Dhar. And al-Abbas comes out and runs out and he, and he says to them, are you people crazy? You're going to kill a man from al-Ghifar? Al-Ghifar was a tribe that was known for robbing people. It's like, you touch Abu Dhar, if, the, if his tribe comes after you, you're all dead. So he saved Abu Dhar's life. So Al-Abbas played it very diplomatically and politically, but he never introduces or he never uh, announces his Islam. So that's why it's completely unknown as to when um, he is a Muslim. As for the mother of Ibn Abbas, Umm Al-Fadl, Lubaba, not only is she an early Muslim, she's actually, she actually says that she accepted Islam on the same day that Khadija radiallahu anha did. So she says that I accepted Islam on the same day as Khadija and she used to pride herself on that because she was a good friend of Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu ta'ala anha. So Lubaba bint al-Harith, the mother of Ibn Abbas, she was public with her Islam. She didn't care, right? And they weren't going to do anything to her. She was part of the boycott, you know, she was included in that. But she said that I was the second woman to accept Islam. And the, the sources of Sirah, they, they disagree as to whether she was the second or the third. They say the sister of Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, Fatima bint al-Khattab, uh, came on the same day as well. So these two women, Fatima bint al-Khattab and Lubaba bint al-Harith, who's the mother of Abdullah ibn Abbas, they both accepted Islam uh, at the same time as Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. As soon as they found out from Khadija what had happened to the Prophet sallallahu they came to the Prophet sallallahu and they announced um, their Islam. And her sister, her sister, being the maternal aunt of Ibn Abbas, who's also going to play an important role, her name is Maymuna bint al-Harith, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And Maymuna, our mother, is a wife of the Prophet sallallahu Rasulullah sallallahu would marry Maymuna about six years after Hijrah. Okay, but she's an early Muslim. But he would marry her about six years after Hijrah, around the time of the Treaty of Al-Hudaybiyyah. And the Prophet Sallallahu he used to call them Al-Akhawat Al-Mu'minat. Al-Akhawat Al-Mu'minat, the believing sisters. So he said that Al-Akhawat Al-Mu'minat Arba'a. Prophet Sallallahu said there are four. They are the daughters of Al-Harith, being Lubaba and Maymuna, radiallahu anhu. And they are Asma and Salma, the daughters of Umais. Asma and Salma, the daughters of Umais. So the Prophet Sallallahu used to call them Al-Akhawat, Al-Mu'minat. And Umm Al-Fadl, uh, the mother of Abdullah, she actually narrated 30 ahadith from the Prophet ﷺ. So we actually have ahadith from her um, as well, through uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, through um, uh, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and through Ubaidullah ibn Abbas. We actually have ahadith that come from the mother of Abdullah ibn Abbas as well. So in the household, just to, just to, to make this clear, in the household you have Abdullah, and you have his siblings who are all older than him. He's the youngest of them except for Ubaidullah. So he has all of his brothers and sisters are older than him and he has a younger brother named Ubaidullah. Okay, They're all practicing Islam. Umm al-Fadl, the mother is practicing Islam. Abu Rafi', the slave of, of, of al-Abbas is also practicing Islam. But he's also not, he's not public with his Islam because obviously if, if a slave comes forth with his Islam, then he'll be killed right away. He's not, he has no protection for himself. Lubaba didn't care. Umm al-Fadl had no, you know, she didn't care. She didn't care if everyone knew that she was Muslim. And obviously, Al-Abbas anhu was protecting uh, the Prophet ﷺ um, as well. So when do we see the next encounter between the Prophet ﷺ and this family? The Battle of Badr. Unfortunately, Al-Abbas went out on the side of the disbelievers now on the day of Badr. 
Why did he do that? He was forced. All of the family members were forced. All of these people were, were sent out. And Rasulullah was aware of it. And the Prophet he says, and this is a hadith in Bukhari, he said that anyone who came to fight us can be killed with the exception of two people. He said, these two people, ukhriju karhan. They were forced to come. They didn't want to come, but they were forced to come. La haja talahum bi qitalina. They have no interest in killing us whatsoever. Now, the Prophet wasn't communicating with Al Abbas, but he was well aware that this was going to happen. And these two people were Abu al Bukhturi, Abu al Bukhturi ibn Hisham, and Al Abbas. Abu al Bukhturi ibn Hisham and Al Abbas. Now, there is a man by the name of Abu Hudayfa ibn Utba, when the, who, who, when he heard the Prophet say that, he said, you want us to kill our fathers and kill our children and kill our brothers and leave Al-Abbas? He says, Wallahi, if I find Al-Abbas in the battlefield, I'm going to strike his neck. Now when the Prophet heard that, Rasulullah was distressed. And Umar was sitting with the Prophet and the Prophet says, Ya Aba Hafs. And Umar said, that's the first time the Prophet ever called me Aba Hafs. So he remembers that day. He said, Ya Aba Hafs. He says, أَيُضْرَبُ وَجْهُ عَمِّ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم بالسيف. Is it really befitting that the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ would be struck by a sword in his face? أَيُضْرَبُ And he kept saying it to Umar رضي الله تعالى عنه. Now Umar رضي الله عنه, anytime anyone distressed the Prophet ﷺ, what was Umar رضي الله عنه's answer? He said, Ya Rasulullah, let me kill him. <laughs> right? Give me permission to strike his neck. He's a hypocrite. Rasulullah ﷺ said, no, leave him alone. Okay? And Abu Hudayfa, he, he was so saddened that he grieved the Prophet ﷺ that he used to say, he used to say, Wallahi, I will never feel safe from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that day unless Allah Azza grants me shahada, unless Allah grants me martyrdom. And he died a shaheed on, in the battle of Al Yamama. Okay, so Abu Hudayfa also had a good ending, but you know, it was just an emotional reaction like, wait a minute, you want us to kill our fathers and brothers and you want us to leave Al Abbas? If I see him, then I'll take care of him. Now, uh, Abu Yusr as Sulumi, Abu Yusr as Sulami, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Yusr says that on the day of Badr, Badr he says, Nazartu ila al Abbas yawma Badr. I saw al Abbas on the day of Badr. Wahuwa qa'imun ka'annahu sanam. And he was standing like he was an idol. He wasn't moving, right? He was standing like he was an idol. So Abu Yusr walked up to him, he grabbed him, and he captured him. Okay, and he brought him to the Prophet Sallallahu and Rasulullah he said, how did you capture him? Now, to put things in perspective, Al-Abbas was a huge man, okay? Abu Yusur was tiny, and that's why he went after Al-Abbas. He's walking around the Battle of Badr, he's like, he's not going to mess with that guy or that guy. It's like, there's Al-Abbas, and he's just standing there like an idol. So Rasulullah says, how did you even manage to physically capture him? And listen to the answer of Abu Yusur. Abu Yusur says, لَقَدْ أَعَانَنِي عَلَيْهِ رَجُلْ مَا رَأَيْتُهُ مِنْ قَبْلْ وَلَا مِنْ بَعْدْ He said, there was a man that helped me that I've never seen before or after. Rasulullah he smiled and he said, لَقَدْ أَعَانَكَ عَلَيْهِ مَلَكٌ كَرِيمٌ That it was a noble angel that helped you to capture him. And the ulama, the scholars, they say that Allah wanted Al-Abbas to be captured early in the battle so that no one would try to kill him. Right, and if he's captured early as well, then his own companions won't question him, right? The tribesmen won't say Al-Abbas was just standing there. So right away Abu Yusr saw him and Abu Yusr went and he got him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, he supported him with an angel. Now Al-Abbas was extremely tall, extremely wide, extremely big to the point that they couldn't find a thobe to cover him. And this is really for historical context, this is very beautiful, subhanAllah. They couldn't find a garment to cover him. And so Rasulullah he asked for someone who was big, right, to give, to give a thobe that could cover him. Who comes forth? Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, the chief of the hypocrites. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul says, Ya Rasulullah, I've got this covered. And obviously Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, after every battle, he always tries to make up to the Prophet right? He always tries to show support to the Prophet after the battle's over. Once a battle starts, he always tries to ruin everything. After the battle's over, he comes forth and he says, Ya Rasulullah, this happened and that happened. He comes with all of his excuses. So when the Prophet ﷺ said, anyone big who can offer a thawb to Al-Abbas, you know, please come forward. Abdullah bin Ubay bin Saru said, I will do it, Ya Rasulullah. And he was, you know, of the exact same stature 
as Al Abbas radiallahu anhu, so it worked perfectly. Now, why is this important for historical context? Because when Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul passed away, and he is, you know, the chief of the hypocrites, and he caught, he wreaked havoc in, in, in amongst the community for nine years to the point that he slandered the wife of the Prophet ﷺ and he spread that slander and he tried to destabilize the Muslim community in any way. When the son of Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul came to the Prophet ﷺ and he asked Rasulullah ﷺ if he could be buried in the garment of the Prophet ﷺ, Rasulullah ﷺ obliged right away because he remembered the day, as, as, as great of a hypocrite as this was, on that day he brought forth a thobe for my uncle. So the Prophet ﷺ, he gave Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul his own garment uh, to be buried in, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if you seek forgiveness for this man or if you don't, it's not going to benefit him at all. Okay, but the Prophet ﷺ, he obliged because of that day. Now, after Badr, Al Abbas is captured. And that night, the night of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ was, was pacing around and he was tearing up. And the Prophet ﷺ, he laid down in his cot and his eyes stayed open throughout the night. And the Sahaba, they noticed. So they came to Rasulullah and they said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, Malik, what's wrong with you? So the Prophet he says, Samirtu anin al Abbas fi wathaqi. I heard my uncle Al Abbas, you know, not crying, but but his 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 groaning uh, due to the chains on him. So the Prophet was grieved because he heard those, and obviously it, it hurt the Prophet because he loves Al Abbas Allah Ta'ala He said, But I heard him uh, doing so. So one of the compa- so the Prophet said, you know, if only his chains could be loosened a little bit. So he's not uncomfortable. But the Prophet ﷺ, what did he do? He said, you know what, so that it's not unfair, he said, loosen the chains on all of the prisoners. Because it wouldn't be fair to just loosen the chains on Al-Abbas, so loosen the chains on all of the uh, prisoners. And subhanAllah, you know, even at those moments, the Prophet ﷺ is being very just, right? And so, you know, different people's tribes came forth and they ransomed them, you know, they ransomed their prisoners and, and they all came forth with something. Al Abbas didn't have anyone to ransom him. And the Prophet ﷺ was grieved because he wanted Al Abbas to ransom himself. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says that some of the Ansar, they came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said to the Prophet ﷺ, you know, let us ransom Al Abbas because we're related to him through his mother. The mother of Al Abbas. Uh, had some roots from Yathrib, from al Madina. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, he's, he's still our relative in some way, in a distant way. So they said, we'll take care of him, we'll ransom him. The Prophet ﷺ says, لا والله لا تذرون منه درهم. That's not fair. Do not leave from him a single dirham. You have, you know, you've got, we have to apply the same rules to everyone else. So the Prophet ﷺ, um, you know, as, as Quraysh sent all of these requests now to the Prophet ﷺ to free their prisoners, Rasulullah he went up to Al Abbas. And Al Abbas he said to the Prophet, he said, Ya Rasulullah, he said, You know that I accepted Islam on the inside. So the Prophet, he, he knows that. He knows that Al Abbas is a believer, but he has to treat him like everyone else. So he says to him, Allahu a'lamu bi Islamic. Fa in yakun kama taqul, Allah knows if you're really a Muslim. And if you are, as you say, Fa in Allah yurzika. Wa amma zahiruk. فَقَدْ كَانَتْ عَلَيْنَا If it is as you say, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only will He free you, Allah will reward you. But as for what is apparent, then you were actually fighting against us. So He said to Al Abbas, He said, free yourself and free your cousins. So He started to mention some of the cousins. Nawfal ibn al Harith, Aqil ibn Abi Talib, your family members. Uh, Utba ibn Amr, Al Harith ibn Fihr. The Prophet ﷺ goes through these different names. He says, look, you can free yourself and you can free all of them. So Al Abbas said to the Prophet, ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, I don't have any money. Now the Prophet, ﷺ, when he heard that, Rasulullah, ﷺ, he says, Where is the money that you buried, you and your wife, and you told her as you were leaving Mecca that if anything happens to me, then this money is for this child and this money is for this child? Al Abbas's eyes got big and he said, Ya Rasulullah, A'lamu annaka Rasulullah. I know you are the Messenger of Allah. He said, But we didn't tell anybody about that. No one knows about that. But the Prophet ﷺ, he knew about it. And Rasulullah ﷺ, he said, ransom yourself with that money. Allah Azza wa will reward you. If you're telling the truth, don't worry. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala will reward you. So Al Abbas, he, he ransomed himself with 20 uqiyah. Okay, 20 uqiyah. Uqiyah is, is a, you know, the quantity of uqiyah is like one fourth of a kilo. It's really hard to, to measure those types of things, but it was 20 uqiyah. That's what the narration um, says. 
And he said to the Prophet Sallallahu he says, you know, can, can the spoils of war, can, you know, can my shield, can those types of things be used as well? The Prophet Sallallahu he says, no, لا ذاك شيء أعطان الله تعالى منك. That's something that Allah Azza wa gave to the believer. So I can't take the spoils of war and count that towards your ransom. So you have to ransom yourself with that money. So Al-Abbas, he ransomed himself and his family members and Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala revealed an ayah. Ya ayyuha nabi qul li man fi aydikum min al-asra in ya'lam Allah fi qulubikum khayra yu'tikum khayran mimma ukhidha minkum wa yaghfir lakum wallahu ghafurur rahim. He said, "O Prophet, say to those that are in your control from the captives, if Allah knows of the good in your hearts, he will give you something better than that which was taken from you and he will forgive you." and Allah is most forgiving and most merciful. Now this was revealed in regards to Al-Abbas, okay? And Al-Abbas, he, he used to testify to that ayah, he said, after the day of Badr, after I became Muslim, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me 20 servants in the place of those 20 uqiya. And he said, and, and I hoped for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. And subhanAllah, historically speaking, Al-Abbas became so rich after the day of Badr, that when the Prophet ﷺ gave the speech on the day of uh, in Khutbat al wadaa in his farewell uh, sermon, the Prophet ﷺ, as he was specifying that there is no more riba, that there is no more interest, he specifically said, anyone who owes Al Abbas riba, you know, on their loans, they don't have to, they don't have to pay him that anymore. They just have to pay back their loans because Al Abbas was so generous. As he kept getting richer and richer and richer, he kept distributing loans back, in, you know, all over the place and kept giving to people. So Rasulullah ﷺ said, all of the riba on those loans is forgiven. All the interest on those loans is forgiven. So anyway, Abbas goes free. Now, we go back to the house of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says that um, Umm uh, al-Fadl, his mother, Umm al-Fadl, Lubaba, she was sitting in a room with Abu Rafa, the slave of Al-Abbas, and Abu Lahab was really nervous. Abu Lahab is walking around, he's going through the houses of the family members and he's waiting for someone to come home. So Abu Lahab, you know, he sits down and he puts his back on the back of Abu Rafa. Like, you know, just waiting for the answer. So Abu Sufyan comes at that time. And Abu Sufyan, as he comes, Abu Lahab jumps up and he says, Mal khabar? He says, what happens? Because Abu Lahab still doesn't know what happened on the day of Badr, you know, what happened in the battle. So Abu Sufyan, he says, you know, we, we found the people that were small in number, but great in courage. We found the people small in number and great in courage. They killed us however they felt like, you know, they killed us in ways that they felt like doing and they captured us in ways that they felt like doing. Meaning they could do whatever they want with us. They just handled us completely. And he said, there were men with them. And listen to what Abu Sufyan uh, says. He says, there were men with them that filled the skies. They could strike us, but we couldn't strike them. Meaning, the, you know, the angels, the malaika. So Abu Rafa', he's sitting there listening. And Abu Rafa' said, I couldn't contain the joy in my heart. Because Abu Rafa' is a Muslim. So Abu Rafa, he jumps up, he says, رَفَعْتُ صَوْتِي وَيَدِي He said, I raised my voice and I raised my hand and I said, تِلْكَ وَاللَّهِ هِيَ الْمَلَائِكَ تِلْكَ وَاللَّهِ هِيَ الْمَلَائِكَ I swear by Allah, those are the angels. I swear by Allah, those are the angels. When he did that, Abu Lahab started to beat him almost to death. Abu Lahab punched him so hard that he flew to the ground and Abu Lahab literally climbed on top of him and started punching him in the face. Closed fist, dealing, you know, just giving him blows to the head. Now, Umm al-Fadl, when she saw that happening, Umm al-Fadl, she took one of the poles of the tent and she, she cracked it across the head of Abu Lahab and she actually, she actually exposed his skull. She hit him so hard that, he, that she exposed his skull and the blood came running down uh, from his head and she said, أَقَوِيْتَ عَلَيْهِ يَا أَبَا لَهَبْ أَسْتَغْوَيْتَ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ غَابَ عَنْهُ سَيِّدُ you know, you think, you're, you, think you, can, you can display that type of power. You really think that you could take advantage of him because his master is not here, right? You think you could treat him that way because Al-Abbas is not here? He's not your slave, you don't do that to him. And SubhanAllah, she hit him so hard that it could have been the cause of his death because Abu Lahab died a week later. So some of them say that there is maybe an infection or something of that sort because of how hard she hit the head of Abu Lahab with that tent pole. And you could see the skull of Abu Lahab and maybe when they were treating him, he got sick, he developed a fever, an ulcer, all kinds of things started to happen to him. But it started from that moment from when the mother of Abdullah ibn Abbas actually cracked him across, you know, hit him across the head with a tent pole. Now, from that point onwards, Al Abbas is still concealing his Islam. And we don't know if he's Muslim again, you know, but it seems to be that way. He certainly follows the news of the Muslims. And there are some indications in the Sirah that though there is no authentic report, 
that he's delivering messages to the Prophet ﷺ, strategically informing the Prophet ﷺ about what's going on. But Umm al-Fadl and Abdullah and the family are practicing Islam, and that's for sure. And actually when Al-Abbas heard about Khaybar, when he heard about what was taking place in Khaybar, um, Al-Abbas, he held his son Quthum. Quthum is a brother of Abdullah, and he held him close and he, he actually said words of poetry. He said, Hubbi Quthum, Hubbi Quthum. He said, my love Quthum, my love Quthum. Now Quthum uh, resembled the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he says, Shabihu dhil anfil asham. Shabihu dhil anfil asham. The one who resembles him most in his noble look. He's talking about the Prophet ﷺ. He says, Nabi Rabbi Dil Ni'am, the Prophet of my Lord who controls all bounties. Biraghmi Anfi Man Raghim. Despite all now that's I'm not gonna literally translate that, but despite the arrogance of anyone who rejects. Okay, so he was holding Qutum and he's and he's author, you know, he's saying these words of poetry. He's obviously grieving for the Prophet ﷺ and he celebrates when the Prophet ﷺ, um, has good news. Now when does Al-Abbas finally come and officially accept Islam? He comes with his family and he accepts Islam right before Fatah Mecca, right before the conquest of Mecca. Why? Because now everything is sort of set. There is no benefit to hiding your Islam at this point because the Muslims obviously are now powerful and, and it's only a matter of time before Mecca comes back under the control of the Prophet um, So that was right before uh, the year 630, 20 years after um, Umm al-Fadl, after the mother of Abdullah ibn Abbas. And uh, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu he used to say, he said something very beautiful. He said, Wallahi, la Islam al Abbas ahabbu ilayya min Islam al Khattab. He says, I swear by Allah that Al Abbas becoming Muslim is more beloved to me than the Islam of my own father had he become Muslim. He says, لِأَنَّ إِسْلَامِ الْعَبَّاسِ أَحَبُّ إِلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم مِنْ إِسْلَامِ الْخَطَّابِ He said because the Prophet ﷺ, you know, uh, or, or he says that the Islam of Al-Abbas was more beloved to the Prophet ﷺ than the Islam of my father. So he said that day when Al-Abbas became Muslim was, it was a happier day in my life than had my own father took shahada because of how happy the Prophet ﷺ was. And Rasulullah ﷺ, you know, he used to honor Al-Abbas anhu. He said, Al-Abbas minni wa ana min. Al-Abbas is from me and I am from you. And subhanAllah, whenever they sort of reunite, you can see that the Prophet ﷺ honors Al-Abbas and he honors the family of Al-Abbas every time he sees him. And this is important in understanding now Abdullah ibn Abbas and where he's coming from because the entire family of Al-Abbas is always around the Prophet ﷺ now. So when Al-Abbas would walk into a room, um, Rasulullah ﷺ, he would stand up and he would kiss him on the forehead. And he would say, هَذَا عَمِّي This is my uncle. فَمَنْ شَاءَ Whoever wants to boast about their uncle, let them, let them try to compete with my uncle. Meaning my uncle beats your uncle. The Prophet ﷺ is obviously making Al-Abbas feel good. Al-Abbas said, Ya Rasulullah, he said, O Messenger of Allah. And it's beautiful because SubhanAllah, even though he's his nephew, he, he addresses him as the Messenger of Allah Wasallam. He says, Ya Rasulullah, it's not befitting of you to say that about me. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, وَلِمَ لَا أَقُولُ هَذَا Why shouldn't I say that? وَأَنْتَ عَمِّي وَبَقِيَّةُ أَبَائِي والعموالد. He said, why shouldn't I say that when you are my uncle and you are what's left of my father? والعموالد. And the uncle is like a father. And the Prophet ﷺ, um, you know, he, he said, um, Al-Abbas is the uncle of Rasulullah ﷺ. Rasulullah ﷺ is saying, Al-Abbas is the uncle of Rasulullah and the uncle of a man is the, is the sinwu of his father. The sinwu in the Arabic language is the equal of the father. Al-Ammu So the Prophet ﷺ said the uncle is like a father. So he used to treat Al-Abbas like his own father. And when the Prophet ﷺ is making his way now to Mecca during the conquest, he's now communicating on a regular basis with Al-Abbas. And Al-Abbas now is serving sort of as a liaison between the Prophet ﷺ and the other leaders of Quraysh. So Al-Abbas is the one who comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says to the Prophet ﷺ, he says, look, Abu Sufyan is a man of pride. He's Muslim, but he has a lot of pride. So he said, you know, if you want to, he said, he said I, I think you should do something for him. So the Prophet ﷺ said, what do you suggest? He says that whenever you come to Mecca and you announce places of safety, he said, make the house of Abu Sufyan a place of safety. And the Prophet ﷺ, he obliged. The Prophet ﷺ, when he entered into Mecca, he says, مَنْ دَخَلَ دَارَ أَبِي Sufyan, فَهُوَ آمِنٌ Whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. So he gave Abu Sufyan, uh, his, you know, he, he gave Abu Sufyan what Al-Abbas thought that he should give him. Uh, to make things easier for him. 